Okay, so this next section that we're going to cover, um, there's going to be two main subjects that we're going to talk about. The first of which is something that is referred to as Bayes' theorem. Now the equation and the formula looks really long and complicated. Once we start getting into the examples, you'll realize it's not quite as bad as it looks like. Um, these types of problems that we're going to be using with Bayes' theorem are typically involving medical studies, um, specifically um, dealing with like a test that you do for something. So you might be given a test where you have a certain percentage where a certain percent chance that you test positive, certain percent chance that you test negative, but then we also have to take into account that there are uh, certain times where the test might fail. So for example, you might be infected with something but not test positive, or conversely, you might not be infected but still test positive. We call that a false positive. So um, Bayes' theorem says that the probability of A given B Oops, I wrote these backwards. Okay, so probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B given A. So basically just this part flipped around, divided by P of A times P of B given A, so the same exact same thing that we had on the top, plus P of A complement which remember that just means the probability that A doesn't happen essentially, times the probability of B given A complement. So like I said, the formula looks really complicated, probably doesn't make too much sense, but once we get into the next example, it should make a little bit more sense. Okay, so for this example, I'm just gonna kind of read through it quick. If you need to pause to get this part copied down, please feel free to do so. So we have a virus that infects one out of every 400 people. A test is positive 85% of the time if the person has it. So if the person has the virus, they do the test, 85% of the time it'll come back positive. There's also a 5% chance that it doesn't. This is what we were talking about with the false positive. So a person does not have the virus, um, but actually tests positive. So there's a 5% chance of that. So we're going to let event A be that the person has the virus, event B be that the person tests positive. So we want to first find the probability that the person has the virus given the fact that they test positive. So this is the probability of A given B, just so that we can follow along with that base there. Okay, so I'm going to first start by writing down a couple of uh, values that we know. So first of all, the probability of A. So the probability that the person actually has the virus. Well, it says that the virus infects one in 400 people. So that would be 1 out of 400, which if we divide this on a calculator, is going to give us 0 0.0025. So that's the decimal. Now we also know, therefore, the probability of a complement, which basically just means that the probability that the person doesn't have the virus. Well, if 1 out of every 400 people do have it, that means that 399 out of those 400 people do not. So that would be 399 over 400 which would equal 0 0.9975. We could also take 1 for 100% and subtract the 0 0.0025, and that would give us the decimal here. Okay, so that is a value that we know. We also know the probability of B given A. So we know that the probability that a person tests positive given the fact that they have the virus. This is the 85% chance. Okay, so given the fact that the person has the virus, there's an 85% chance that they will test positive. So 0 0.85. So therefore, we also know the probability of B given A complement, which is the probability that the person tests positive given the fact that they don't have the virus. So this is that false positive we were talking about, and that is going to be the 5% that the problem told us. So 0 0.05. Okay, so now that we have these values, now we can start figuring out some other things. So a lot of times for these, it's going to be easiest if we make a table of values. So I'm going to make a table where I have positive, which is event B, negative, which is B complement, and then the total. Those will be the columns. For the rows, we're going to say that they have the virus, 
which is event A. They don't have virus, so that would be A complement, and then the total. Okay? Now, instead of thinking of this in terms of decimals, of what we're going to do is we are going to turn this into a number of people just so that the math comes out a little bit easier. That way we don't have to do decimals. Every single one of, well, the biggest number of decimals that we see are these two here, which have four decimals. Well, the fourth decimal place is 10,000. So what we're going to do is for the sake of argument, we are going to pretend like we have 10,000 people, okay? So of what that tells us is if we multiplied each of these by 10,000, that would just give us a whole number of people, okay? So of uh, what we can do next, so let's see. Um, so the total number of people who actually have the virus. So that was one out of every 400 people. That was the 0 0.0025. So if we take the 10,000 and multiply it by 0 0.0025 out of this imaginary group of 10,000 people, that would tell us that a total of 25 people have the virus. So that includes the people who test positive and the people who test negative. So this value here is going to be 25. Therefore, we also know the number of people who don't have the virus. Since there's a total of 10,000, we can take 10,000 and subtract 25, or we could take this 0.9975 and multiply that by 10,000. So that gives us 9,975 people. So that gives us a grand total of the 10,000. And once again, this 10,000 is just an imaginary number that we're making up. Okay, you can really pick any number, you just might end up with a decimal, okay? So now to fill out some of the other values. If the person has the virus, the odds that they test positive are 85%. So what we're going to do is we're going to take 85% of the total number of people who have the virus. So we're going to take 25 and multiply it by 0.85. So if we multiply those together, that is going to give us 21.25, okay? So I know that this gives us a decimal, but we're gonna keep it as the decimal just for the sake of argument, okay? So we know that the grand total number of people who have the virus is 25. There's 21.25 people who test positive. Well, that means that the rest of them have to test negative. So if we do 25 minus 21.25, that tells us that out of this group, there are 3.75 people who actually test negative, okay? Given the fact that they have the virus. So now for the next one, um, the chances that they don't have the virus, so A complement. Um, so if we took the grand total, so the 9975, we can multiply it by the probability that they actually test positive if they don't have the virus. Well, if the person has the virus, there's a 5% chance or I'm sorry, if the person tests positive, there's a 5% chance that they don't have it. So we'll multiply this by 0 0.05, and then this goes back into the calculator. So if we multiply these, that gives us 498.75. So then for the negatives, once again, we can just take the total for that row and subtract the 498.75, and that gives us 9476. 0.25. So now we can get the totals for the individual rows. Or I'm sorry, for the individual columns. So if we add these two numbers here together, that gives us 520. If we add these two together, that gives us 9,408. So in an imaginary group of 10,000 people, there would be 520 people who test positive and 9,480 people who test negative, okay? So now uh, for the next part, I'm going to erase um, most of the work that we have here, but I will leave the table just so that we can see the values. Okay, so now we can finish up the question. So the question ultimately wanted us to find the probability, probability that the person had it given the fact that they tested positive. So that was the probability of A given B. Well, we could use the Bayes theorem for this, but we know, based off what we talked about in the first video, that when we have a conditional probability, this is the probability of A and B together divided by the probability of B. 
Well, now that we have this table, the positive person who has the virus, there were 21.25 people where that happened. Divided by the probability of B, so for B, there was a grand total, if we go to the bottom of the column, there were a total of 520 people who tested positive. So if we divide these two and get the decimal, that would be 0 0.0409, which means approximately 4.09%. So 4.09% of people test positive and have the virus. So of what this tells us is there's actually a pretty small number of people who get tested that have the virus that will ultimately test positive. So what this tells us is the test does not do a very good job of actually correctly assessing a positive. Okay? Now, for a second example, since we have all the numbers right here, let's do the probability of A complement given B complement. So this would be the probability that they don't have the virus given the fact that it tests negative. Well, we would calculate this the same way as up here. We would do the probability of both of these two things together. So A complement, B complement. There were 9,476.25 people where that happened. Divided by B complement, which is the fact that they tested negative. So there were 9,480. Well, if we take these two numbers and divide them and convert this to a percentage, that gives us 99.96%. So this is the probability that the person does not have it, given the fact that they got a negative. So what this tells us is if, it's, if the test turns up positive, we don't really know for sure if they actually have it or not. Okay, So that's what that low percentage told us. This high percentage here says that if they test negative, there's an extremely high chance that they don't have it. Okay, And this is something that they do a lot of times with testing, is they kind of try to find a balance of something that shows... A really high positive result when a person has it and a really high negative result when the person doesn't have it but a lot of times you kind of have to balance the two a lot of times if it tests one thing really well it tests the other thing poorly or vice versa so it's almost like kind of a sliding scale there okay so i hope that this example made sense um, to finish this off of what we're going to do since we have all the numbers here is we're going to show how we would recalculate this by using the Bayes theorem formula now, if you just have to calculate one value, I think it's easier to use the formula. If there's more than one thing that you're calculating, I think it's easier to make this table like what we did here. Okay, so I'm not going to rewrite the uh, base formula. I'm just going to kind of speak it out loud because this should be written in your notes. This is the very first thing that I put on there. So for the base theorem on the top, we have the probability of A times the probability of B given A. Well, the probability of A um, so the probability that the person actually had the virus was 0 0.0025. Now the probability of B given A, so the probability that they were positive given the fact that they had the virus, that was that 85% that we had in the initial um, problem. So multiply that by 0.85. Now in the denominator, there were the two different parts we had. Remember, we said the first part was the exact same as the numerator. So 0 0.0025 times 0 0.85 plus the second part, which was the probability of A complement, um, multiplied by the probability of B given A complement. So the probability of A complement, that was the probability that they did not have um, the virus given the fact that they um, were tested. So that was that 99.75% that we came up with earlier. That was the 9975 here. So we'll multiply this by 0.9975 times the probability of B given a complement. So the probability that they test negative given the fact that they don't have it, that was that 5% that we had in the initial problem. So kind of running out of room here. So multiply by 0.05. So then we would uh, multiply the top in the calculator, we would do the bottom in the calculator, and then divide those two numbers, and that would give us the 0 0.0409, or that 4.09% that we got from up here. Okay, so it's kind of up to you how you want to do this. The formula looks more complicated, the table actually requires doing a little bit more work, 
But to me, the table makes the values a little bit easier because then you can kind of look at them and you can kind of tell that they make sense. So like, for example, this value here, this tells us that the person does not have the virus and they test positive. So it's easier to just look at all the numbers and remember exactly what they are without having to go back and forth. Okay, so I hope that this example made sense. Okay, so this last part should hopefully be a little bit easier than the Bayes theorem. Um, this will be the last topic that we will cover, which is something called expected value. Expected value is essentially just kind of like an average. It's really just the probability way that we express an average. Okay, so there's a few different types of examples we're going to see. I'm going to give you just one easy example first, just so you can see what we're talking about with expected value. Um, and then we'll get into a little bit more complicated one. So let's try to figure out the expected value of rolling a dice, okay? So this basically just says, if we roll a dice, what is the average value that we would get? Well, if we think of this in terms of a probability chart, so I'm going to make a table. On the first row, I'm going to put X, where X is just the different um, rolls that we can get. So when we roll a die, we can have one, two, three, four, five, or a six. In the second row, I'm going to put P of X, where P is the probability that X will happen. So in this case, the probability that you roll a one. Well, that would be one out of six. Probability that you roll a two is also one six. Probability that you roll any of these is one six. Now, once we have a table like this where we have all outcomes and the probability of those outcomes, of what we're going to do is we're going to multiply each column together and then we're going to simply add the values. So we're going to do one times one six, which gives us one six, two times a six, which gives us two six. Now I know that this can reduce, but I'm gonna keep all the denominators six until the very end. Three times a six gives us three six, four times a six is four six, Five times a six is five six, and then six times a six gives us six six. So now we add together all the numbers in the top. So one plus two gives us three, plus three gives us six, plus four gives us 10, plus five gives us 15, plus six gives us 21. So if we take 21 and we divide this by six in the calculator, that would actually give us 3.5. So the average value that you would roll is going to be a 3.5. Now, obviously you can't really roll a decimal, but this makes more sense when we are dealing with two, okay? Um, some of you guys might be familiar with this game, some of you might not, um, but there is a popular casino game that's called Craps, which involves rolling dice. Now, the most popular number to pick um, or the number to anticipate you rolling is going to be a seven. Well, the reason that the, you have the highest odds of getting a 7 is because your expected value for one die is 3.5, your expected value for the other is 3.5. Well, if you add 3.5 and 3.5, that gives you 7. So when you roll 2, mathematically, you have the highest odds of rolling a 7 as any combination between the two die. Okay? So I hope that this first example makes sense. Now for the second one, we're going to get a little bit more like percentages and stuff. So a company says that 0.2% of their products will fail after the warranty period, which is two years. The replacement cost of the item is $250. So if you didn't have a warranty, if you're just buying a new one, it's $250. Um, if you buy a two-year warranty, it's $28. What is the expected value for the company of the warranty? Okay, so we basically want to figure out, essentially on average, how much money does the company earn to sell these warranties. Obviously they want to sell as many warranties as possible, but they don't want to replace too many items. So they have to figure out the correct price to sell it at so that they're not basically giving away their product for free. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to break this up into pieces. So first we're going to look at the probability that they have to replace the product. Well, there's a 0.2% chance that they have to replace it. So that would be 0.002. So then the probability that they don't replace, so just meaning your product turns out fine, is just going to be 100% minus 0.2%. So that would be 99.8% or 
or as a decimal, that would be 0.998. Okay, so now we're going to split this into two parts. We're going to look at the cost of replacement, and then we are going to look at the revenue they get from non-replacement. Okay, so let's say for the sake of argument that the company has to replace a product that was under warranty. Well, first, the company earns $28 from selling that warranty plan. So they would have a net positive of $28 there. But now that the product broke, now they have to give away one of the products for free. So the replacement cost was $250. That is a cost that the company just has to eat. So we're going to subtract the $250. So that gives us negative 228. So that means if they sell one warranty, they have to give the product back, the company loses $228, okay? Um, now the revenue that they actually get from, um, if they don't have to replace it, it's just going to be the $28. So this is the cost. The revenue, if they don't actually end up having to replace it, is just going to be the $28 because they sold the warranty, they didn't have to replace the product. So the way that we're going to do expected value is we're going to take the cost, multiply it by the probability that they will have to give this cost. We will then take the revenue, multiply it by the probability that they give that revenue, and then we add the two together. So if the company has to pay out, they lose $228. So we're going to take the negative 228 and multiply it by the odds that that happens. So that's the probability probability that they replace the product, which is 0 0.002. Now we are going to find the probability, or we're going to find the expected value if um, we're just looking at the revenue. So if they don't have to replace the product, well, that would be $28 for the company, and there's a 99.8% chance that that happens. So we're going to add this to 28 times 0.998. Now we plug this whole thing into the calculator and this is going to give us the expected value. So the expected value is going to be $27. So on average, between every single one of the products that they sell, for the ones that they have to actually give the product away for free because it breaks under warranty, and then taking the uh, money from the warranties for the people who don't actually have the product break, on average for every single one of the products, they are going to make $27. It costs $28 for the warranty, so the company actually makes quite a bit of their money back for every single one of these. Okay, so I hope that this example made sense. Okay, so we're going to do one last example. This is going to be similar to the one that we did previously. Um, we're going to imagine that we are playing a card game. So Bob and Alice are playing. Um, out of a deck of cards, Bob is going to select a card. If it is a face card, which means it's a jack, a queen, or a king, Alice has to pay him $3. If not, so if he gets any other card, then Bob has to pay her $2. What is the expected value for both? So of what we're going to do first is we're just going to do this with respect to Bob. So the probability that we get a face card, so um, we have three different face cards for each suit. So we have jacks, queens, and kings, but there's a total of four suits that we can have. So three times four is going to give us 12 out of the 52 cards that we have in the deck. Okay? Um, so then the probability that it's not a face card is equal to, so if there's 12 out of the 52 that are, that means that 40 out of the 52 are not. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to multiply the probabilities by the values. We're doing this with respect to Bob. So if Bob gets a face card, he earns $3, okay? So we're going to take the $3, put Bob right here. We're gonna take $3 and multiply by the probability that he gets that $3, which is if he gets a face card. So we're gonna multiply that by the 12 over 52. Now we're going to add this to the other probability, so essentially the probability that he loses. Well, the probability that he loses is 40 out of 52. And if he loses, he has to pay her $2. So essentially he earns negative $2. So we're gonna do negative two 
times the 40 over 52. Okay? So now we multiply each of these and then we add them together. So 3 times 12 gives us 36 over 52. Negative 2 times 40 gives us negative 80 over 52. So if we do 36 minus 80, that is going to give us negative 44 over 52. Okay? So this amount of money, so basically this fraction of a dollar, is what um, amount of money he's actually expected to lose every single time. Okay? So he has a higher chance of losing money than winning money. So, I forgot to write the decimal, but we could just divide that in the calculator and write the decimal, and that would be his expected value. Now, let's say that we wanted to do Alice's. Well, the only thing that really changes, the probabilities are the same and the payouts are the same. The only thing that changes is the perspective. So, if he wins, she has to pay $3, so that makes this number a negative. But if he loses, then she wins, that makes this a positive. So, the uh, the number that you have is actually going to be the same, it'll just be the opposite sign. So since his is negative 44 over 52, hers is positive 44 over 52. So when you just have two people that you're comparing like that, the expected value of one in a money game like that will be the negative of the expected value of the other. Okay, so I hope that this example made sense. If you have any other questions, especially on the Bayes theorem one, because I know that that one was um, a little bit more difficult, please feel free to reach out. There's also a couple of attached videos um, in Slick Canvas on the exercises as well, if you guys need.